thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for coming at 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, I am really impressed that everybody who was on the corner moved because I was uh, looking around the room and I was going to force everybody to move to the center of the room before I started talking. So, um, so this is a small group and I'm delighted to be here and uh, you must be somewhat motivated because I'm sure nobody threatened you to come here. So what I'm going to start off by saying is um, it's more interesting for me and it's also I think more interesting for you if you ask questions as they come up. So please interrupt me. If you have a question, if something doesn't make sense to you, chances are good that it probably doesn't make sense. Something I said doesn't make sense to everybody else in the room. So um, do stop me. I would much rather you know, have us have an interactive conversation and make sure that everybody understands what I'm trying to get across and not necessarily say everything than, uh, than have people doze off. And I'm sure having put in the energy to come in this morning, you don't want to doze off either. OK, so let me uh, try and give you a framework for the motivation for some of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, if we look at current state-of-the-art techniques for what I'm calling representation and transmission of visual information. And I've listed compression techniques here because historically I'm a compression person. But you can fill in um, your, your favorite algorithm there, be it for enhancement or um, noise reduction or whatever you want to do. Anything to process an image that's going to be used by people at the other end, okay? not used by machine uh, vision type algorithms. We have very, very good signal processing machinery to deal with these, uh, uh, these signals these days, right? We sort of we beat them to death with frequency transforms. We have pretty sophisticated statistical models for them. We have a very good idea on how we want to quantize them. And there's a chunk in there that really has to be there for the efficiencies that we're getting today that includes models of the human visual system. Um, and overall, this model, and in particular, that, that big cog that I have for signal processing machinery, this works very, very well when resources are not limited. So what I mean by that is really when you have enough bandwidth, when your file size is large enough. Okay? And that translates in the image to when the image basically looks good. Okay? When you look at it and you don't think, whoa, there's a lot of compression artifacts there, you think, yeah, okay, this is what I expected it to look like. Now the problem is when resources become scarce, every single bit counts. And what I mean by that is as the receiver, gets every single bit coming in, we really would like that bit, or at least with the collection of bits around it, to contain useful information that is going to add content to that image such that it's going to look better for you. And the challenge is that signal processing machinery really breaks down at low bit rates, okay, at low resource. The statistical models start to fail, and the HVS models actually don't really apply to that regime anymore. So with respect to this body of work, what we have tried to do is um, develop, now my, my little diagram says new. New I think is perhaps a, an aggressive word here. Really more accurate human visual system models. And the, the, the key phrase here is really suitable for image applications, okay, via strategic psychophysical experimentation. And what I mean by that is, uh, for any of you who have taken a psychology class or you know, even just read popular science, uh, you know that, for example, a neuroscientist who's studying the visual system, uh, his or her goal may be to predict spike trains coming out of a particular neuron right, in the visual cortex. And their models can sometimes very, very successfully predict what comes out there, especially if they're doing, uh, working with a low-end low visual system, like, for example, the crawfish. Um, but even if we have a nice model for human spike trains, I, as a signal processing engineer, I have absolutely no idea how to translate a spike train into something that we see, something that we think about, and how do I get that into, say, a JPEG compression engine, all right? So once we have those models, then the question becomes, well, now can we go back to the signal processing and say, all right, how can we design a system that's best going to exploit those models? Okay. So I'll give you... Uh, kind of a snapshot of, of both of these. Now, um, grand motivation for some of this is trying to understand how we can determine what makes a better image. Now, everybody is sitting at a different depth here. Those of you in the back, can you see the little JPEG blocks here on the left-hand side? You can't. Okay, so, so 
Here we have you know, two images. Um, both of them are visibly distorted. I have to say, when we project, it's not so obvious that there are distortions here. But if you saw it on the screen, it would look quite blobby. And I can ask the question, which one of these images is better? Okay? And statistically speaking, 75% of humans will pick this one, and 25% of humans will pick this one, okay? to which I say there's no accounting for taste. right? But uh, you know, how do we get a computer to make this decision? How do we get a computer to do this? And you know, the, the cheating way is to say, oh, simple. I just put in a little 8 by 8 edge detector. And you know, I say that, that, that I'm going to pick up JPEG images. But you know, that's a very difficult question. Now, both of these images uh, have exactly the same rate. Okay? So an underlying goal of what we're doing here is we really would like some machinery um, so that we can create, for any bit rate, the best image possible. Okay, we want to put the distortion in exactly the right places. Okay, so I think I'm going to skip this and just go to the outline. So here's what I'm going to try and get through this morning. First thing I'll do is give you some classical psychophysical results. And these are the results that uh, some of these results, current uh, HVS models in, in imaging systems are based upon. Um, say a little bit about wavelets just to make sure everybody is mathematically on the same page here. And then I'll tell you what we've done in my lab to characterize the visual system and show you what happens when we put those better characterizations, or maybe I should say more useful characterizations, into uh, uh, algorithms. Okay, so here's a model for the human visual system. Uh, I don't expect everybody to be able to read all this. The point of this is, you know, we go in through the eye. Um, we pass through something called the uh, lateral genticulate nucleus, which all uh, signal processing people who work with the brain completely ignore and pretend like it's not there. And then we go into V1, the visual cortex. Okay? And V1 is low-level vision, and it's also doing things that can be well-modeled by signal processing, such as filtering. Okay? It also does some things like edge detection and motion detection. But we're primarily going to stick, uh, stick to V1. And let's look at three classical results for V1. So before I talk about the results, read the first line on this slide. Experiments with sinusoidal gratings. Okay. So what we have in the upper right-hand corner is a sinusoidal grating. I've picked something that varies only in the horizontal direction, not in the vertical. And I've weighted it by a Gaussian. So this is, in fact, referred to as a Gabor patch. Okay. I'll just call it a sinusoidal patch. Um, this is uh, uh, a little basis function you can think of, right? And this is the probe. This is the visual equivalent to those individual tones that you get in audio tests when you put the earmuffs on and, and, and your hearing is tested. Um, and I, you know, I'll just make an asi a side comment here. Um, how often do you walk down the street and see a sinusoid? Okay, we, we tend not to see individual sinusoids sitting around. So result number one is the CSF, the contrast sensitivity function. And we're low pass. So this is a plot of what, what we would call the frequency response of the visual system. The horizontal axis is spatial frequency. Spatial frequency is measured in cycles per degree. And I have a little illustration on the right that shows how spatial frequency is measured. Um, my vertical axis is sensitivity. So a higher sensitivity means that something is easier to see. And I'd like to note that this is a log-log plot. Right? It's log in both x and y. We have a peak in visual sensitivity around four to six cycles per degree. And the fall off is then very, very, very fast, okay, very fast. Now, I'll just make one side comment here. Um, one reason why designing systems that uh, are going to be used by humans to see and to look at content is a little bit challenging. Uh, when I'm standing here speaking, those of you in the front of the room and those of you in the back of the room and the gentleman who has just walked in, come to the middle of the room, please. Um, you all hear the same frequencies. Okay? You hear the same frequencies coming out of my mouth. However, those of you in the back, in fact, everybody in this room, sees this patch at a slightly different frequency because your visual angle on that patch is different. And in fact, even if my observer here takes one step back, he has changed the frequency of the content. Okay? The content hasn't changed, but the frequency and his sensitivity to it has, simply based on where, he, where he's standing. OK, so some comments on the CSF. Right? So I just put up the frequency response of the visual system. Now, if you think about it for about a minute, 
you make some logical conclusions. Number one, I didn't say anything about orientation. Horizontal, vertical, 45 degrees, okay? Secondly, it's just for one sinusoid, okay? And thirdly, I'll make the comment here, it represents what we call sub-threshold perception, meaning that CSF is measured at just the point where people can barely see that something is there, okay? So right at the threshold of perception. Now, applying sub-threshold results to compression, where you're really going to squash the image and you're going to have very, very visible distortions, maybe is not the right thing to do. Because those distortions at very low rates are certainly not at the threshold of perception. They're very much in your face. Uh, okay, so second result. Okay. Now notice my little patch has changed. My little patch is now um, a checkerboard. Okay. So a logical thing that uh, a psychophysicist did was once they had measured the response to single sinusoids, they get the response to multiple sinusoids at a time. And the question to pose there is if we know at what uh, amplitude, think of amplitude here, these two patches are visible. If I superimpose them, can I predict at which point this patch is going to be visible? Can I predict when people are going to be able to see that? Okay. And the answer to this question is yes. Um, and uh, so this is the most detailed equation I'm going to have in the whole talk. Uh, and now, this equation comes from uh, psychophysical detection. Very, very straightforward. Whenever you do experiments with people, you assume that 50% of the time they're actually doing the right thing and they're actually trying to answer your question. And 50% of the time they're looking out the window and randomly guessing. Okay, so you put all this together uh, and actually it's fairly straightforward to, to, to arrive at such an equation. Now, I don't want to dwell on this. The point I want to make is that for sinusoids, okay, again, for our little sinusoidal patches, this parameter beta, has been repeatedly measured to be somewhere between two and four. Okay? And what that corresponds to is that the amplitude, average amplitude of two sinusoids when you superimpose them for people to see the, the, the compound stimuli is about 40% lower okay, than, than just looking at each one individually. Okay? Now just remember that two and four because we'll come back to that. Okay. And lastly, there is um, something called the standard gain control model for masking. Now, if you look at my stimulus in the corner, uh, now I've added some Gaussian noise to it. Okay, so I have the same little Gabor patch with some Gaussian noise. Now, imagine that I added so much Gaussian noise that you couldn't see, or let's think about the thought experiment this way. Let's lower the amplitude on the sinusoid so all you see is Gaussian noise. Okay? And then imagine that I increase the amplitude and increase the amplitude and increase the amplitude on that sinusoid. And at some point, you say, oh, even though I see a lot of noise, I can now see that there's, a, there's an underlying uh, sinusoid there. Okay. So the standard gain control model for masking uh, predicts if you start off, instead of with a flat field with Gaussian noise, then how much amplitude do you need in order to be able to see something? Okay. So this is the only part of these three results that can be applied in some manner to what we would consider to be natural image content and to predict the output very well. And that works for homogeneous texture patches. So instead of starting off with a flat field of Gaussian noise, you can imagine you start off with a flat field that looks like the texture on these chairs. Okay? The standard gain control model will predict reasonably well when you're going to see a sinusoid there. Okay, so, all right, here's some homogeneous textures. So then as a signal processor, Okay. we can ask the following question. Are these three classical results applicable to processing images? Okay, so A, we know that images are the superposition of many sinusoidal components, not just one, not just two. Uh, secondly, images provide a very sophisticated mask okay, to whatever types of distortions we're going to add to them, right? Not just little individual uh, arbitrary homogeneous patches. And the, the last observation I have here is what we're currently working on in my lab. I'm not going to talk about it today. And that's that images have higher level meaning to observers. So if you are flipping through a stack of images to look 
for something very specific, maybe you're looking for a picture of your friend, you can see all kinds of other content, and those images may be very, very poorly represented, but you can determine, you know, that's not my friend, and therefore I don't care. And those images were good enough, even though they were, objectively speaking, really poor representations of what was there. Okay. But we'll just stick with those three. Now, you can guess that the answer to these, um, I'm going to say it's no, okay, because otherwise we're done with the talk. Um, so, so what did we do in my lab? Now, this slide has a lot of text, but bear with me, and I think you'll, you'll be able to figure out what's going on. So if we just stick with the talk, first thing, I want to use realistic maskers, not Gaussian noise. Okay? Because whenever we see mistakes in images, we're seeing them in the context of the image content. Right? There's a picture of Mount Rushmore. Here's a picture of my dog. Okay? I have the underlying image there to start with. So I'm going to use realistic maskers, which are images. And instead of using little sinusoidal uh, basis functions, I'm going to use band-limited, spatially correlated quantization noise. Because that is exactly what we get when we do image compression using any kind of frequency-based technique. Okay? So why is it band-limited? Because I only have noise in particular frequency bands, depending on where I quantize. Why is it spatially correlated? because we only have large values on edges, right? The world is predominantly low frequency with edges in it. And we get large edges in correlated locations. Okay. So what we're going to do, forget about the rest of the text here, just look at the little parentheses. I'm going to do a CSF with and without masking. So can I measure the frequency response? I'm going to do the summation experiment and see if I still get a beta between 2 and 4, like we had for the sinusoidal patches. And I'm going to see if I can come up with a masking model that extends beyond just homogeneous patches. And then we'll stick all this stuff into some, uh, some image uh, processing algorithms. And again, this is the question we're working on now. How should the task, what we're asking somebody to do, impact what we should be doing with all of this in the first place. I've really become somewhat of an evangelist on this. Uh, I think that this is the most important thing that we should be worrying about these days. OK, so just a note about wavelets. Um, we're going to work in the context of wavelet transforms uh, simply because JPEG 2000 is a wavelet-based transform. It's generic enough. We're always going to treat images as some type of decomposition. and. Um, as signal processors, we make an argument that this is close to what the eye does, even though it's not. Okay. So uh, what does the wavelet transform do? All I need you to understand is that we can take an input image, we're going to put it through a low-pass filter, and then subsample. Okay. So what happens? Low-pass, you blur it, subsample goes down to a quarter size. Right? And we'll do the same thing with a high-pass filter. High-pass only vertically, but low-pass horizontally, subsample. So we get horizontal edges. Okay? Invert the directions, we get vertical edges. And then we get something that has edges, uh, some people call the HH band, the diagonal band. I just like to call it high frequency content. And we can continue to do this as many times as we want. Uh, this is a critically sampled decomposition. So I do have a little bit of aliasing going on here. Um, but this is what we do in processing real images, so we may as well start off with this as a, as a basis. Okay, so the decomposition in frequency space, here I've given the ideal decomposition, normalized horizontal frequency on the x-axis, so pi is sitting off the, uh, the end, and normalized vertical frequency on the y-axis, and if my filters were ideal, I would be breaking up frequency space into these squares. Okay. Now, let's contrast this with the frequency decomposition that V1, the visual cortex, does. And what you want to do is really just look at the upper right-hand quadrant for a side-by-side -side comparison. This has been, uh, can be measured. Okay? These are approximately the frequency bands that we see. And uh, obviously, I've got this measured in uh, cycles per degree instead of normalized frequency. But the important point here is these are pi-shaped wedges. Okay, there are not right angles here. You are never going to get this decomposition by doing a separable decomposition on an image, right, where we get those right angles. So on the one hand, we as signal processors say, the wavelet transform is great because it's like the multi-channel model. And from the standpoint that, yes, the frequency bands get bigger as we move out to higher frequencies, that's true. 
Okay? But wavelet decompositions we form uh, by taking, you know, basis functions are outer products, and the brain doesn't do any outer products. Okay? So there are many, many differences. But nevertheless, we use them anyway. Okay, the last thing I want to do before I go on is just talk a little bit about what we compute versus what we see. And um, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine because many of us, uh, you know, whatever quality metric we use, whether we use mean squared error, which you know, we as engineers all love, or peak signal to noise ratio, or something that somebody has spent their entire PhD developing as a better quality measure, uh, people often just take the pixels, the values that are stored in the computer, the matrix in MATLAB. Okay? I have a grayscale image. Each pixel goes somewhere between 0 and 255 and just puts that into the algorithm. Now, we don't see those numbers that are stored in the computer. What we see is luminance values on a screen. Okay? And every screen and every monitor is going to output slightly different luminance values for a particular image. And you know this, right? You know this because you look at a digital image on one screen and it looks one way and then you send it to your friend and say, this is the best picture I've ever taken of my child. And then they say, oh, God, what happened to that image? You know, they, they just don't look the same. You see defects on some that you don't see on another. Um, so what I have here is the equation for CRT, but you, know, you pick the display of your choice. The value that sits in the computer is that p-value, the pixel value. And there's a lot of other stuff that goes on before we get to the displayed luminance, which is measured in candelas per square meter. Right? That's a light output value. So it's very important when we talk about trying to quantify what people are seeing and making accurate measurements, that we are doing computations to try to predict what people saw on the luminance, what they actually saw, and not just on those p-values. Okay. Now, the term that we use to quantify all of our stimuli is contrast. And I've defined contrast here in English because there are probably uh, several hundred definitions for contrast in the imaging literature. And that's because fundamentally, contrast is luminance change over mean background luminance. And you can define beyond that okay, whatever contrast should be for your application that makes sense. Okay. So we use RMS contrast simply because when we looked at all the definitions for contrast, that looked like about the right thing. So you can think of RMS contrast as roughly a mean squared error, but in the luminance space, okay, roughly. Okay, skip this. Okay, so let me give you a sense of what we're going to show people. So here's an original image, and I'm going to do a wavelet decomposition on that image like I did of that dog picture. And I'm going to take only one subband, okay, one frequency band out of all of the bands that I've decomposed the image into. And I will uniformly quantize just that band. Okay. So by taking one band, I've uh, band limited where my noise is going to be. And by quantizing it, again, the very fact that you see edges in those high frequency bands, now I have spatially correlated noise because I'm going to have the largest noise values on the edge values because that's where the quantization, uh, uh, the coefficients are largest. So I have my original. I synthesize the image back together. I have what I'm calling the quantized image, even though there's only one band. And you may or may not be able to see the ringing around the bird's body here. This is a very extreme example so that you can see it. But we can subtract the two and then, of course, add 128 because otherwise the mean is zero. And you get a picture here of the quantization noise. Okay? So this image is a superposition of the original and the noise. Okay? And don't worry about what I have down there. Okay, so what are the experiments? Okay. So we do, first off, a detection experiment where all we're doing is showing people these images. Okay, so here's the experiment. They start off completely gray screen. They turn a knob, they turn a knob, they turn a knob, and the quantization noise image that they're shown as they turn the knob, this is a thought experiment, amplitude gets bigger and bigger. In other words, they're seeing the quantization noise image from using bigger and bigger quantization step sizes. Okay? And at some point, they realize I'm no longer looking at a flat screen. Now I see some wiggles in the middle. Okay? And they indicate when they see it. And that gives us the detection threshold okay, for that particular uh, uh, frequency band. And of course, how do we get the frequency band? We have to take into account how far away they are from the screen, right? because we need to measure in cycles per degree. 
So we do, do also a masked detection experiment, which is we show people the original image, and we also show people the quantized image. Okay, so this is a forced choice. They're shown two images. So again, imagine they have a knob, shown two images, and at some point they say, oh, now I can see the difference. I think the image on the left shows some errors relative to the image on the right. And what that gives us is the masked detection threshold. So we measure first when can people see this, and then when can they see this superimposed on the original. Okay, so that gives us a statistical sense of masking. Okay. We do repeat the summation experiment. Okay, so these are exactly the same questions that I asked with the little checkerboard, except now these look like those quantized subbands, and this, this doesn't look like anything to you, right? It looks like a mess. So we get the detection thresholds. And then we repeat it with the image there. So those images came from these. If we know when people see errors here, we know when people see errors here. If we quantize two bands at a time, can we predict when people see errors there? Okay. And of course, we want to be able to predict, but we do an experiment first to determine the thresholds. OK, so what are the results? Okay, so first what I'm going to show are the frequency responses, the CSFs that we measured. Now again, same axes as before. Horizontal, frequent, uh, horizontal axis is spatial frequency in cycles per degree. Vertical axis is sensitivity. How easy is it for people to see? And that blue dashed line is the CSF that's measured for the sinusoids. Okay. So when we do the unmasked experiment, just showing people those little noise patches, we get the top line. Okay. And this is great. Right? If the visual system implements a frequency response, we would expect that frequency response that we measured to be the same, whether we're showing people little individual sinusoids or other basis functions with certain center frequencies. Right? And sure enough, that's what we get. Okay? Now, we're not real worried about what's going on at the low frequencies there, simply because if you think about what's going on when you measure extremely low sensitive, sensitivity to extremely low sinusoids, what's a very, very low frequency sinusoid going to look like? something that just starts to fall off on the sides, right? So it's very hard to measure that accurately. So this, this fall off here on the, the sinusoidal plot, we don't worry about the divergence. Now what's more interesting here is if we look over many frequency bands, okay, and many images, so we're sort of stochastically sampling what's going on here, and we come up with a masked CSF, we get the curve on the bottom. So two things to observe. First is it's, it's much flatter, okay, and that's actually to be expected from some visual system characteristics. The second, okay, that's more interesting to an engineer, is there's an order of magnitude difference there, an order of magnitude. Okay. So this starts to give us a sense of the kind of gains that we can perhaps look for if we actually take into account the fact that distortions are masked by images and not just sitting there right on the screen. Okay. Um, so, nice, a nice result. Now what happened with summation? Okay, so remember I said that for sinusoids that beta value was somewhere between 2 and 4? We measured a beta value between 1.5 and 1.8. Now, if I were a psychophysicist, I would use the round function. And I would say 1.5 to 1.8, that sounds like 2. Ha, look, summation is the same for these little uh, uh, different types of things that I'm doing. But I'm an engineer, and we all know that anything that's linear is much easier to deal with. So we said, let's take the floor function, and let's see if we can approximate beta as 1 instead of 2. Okay? So when we pick 1, then we get linear summation. So great, life is easy. Now, of course, you know, you, I'm being a little flippant here. You can't just define the floor, we'll take the floor function and run with it. So we went to the literature and said, well, has anybody else seen linear summation in some type of psychovisual experiments? And the answer actually was yes. People had measured linear summation, but they had measured linear summation in experiments that had to do with object recognition. Now, why is this interesting? Okay. Think about an object recognition task. If you are showing people pictures and asking them if they recognize something, you are asking them to do a fairly high-level cognitive task. Okay. What were we asking people to do in contrast? We were showing people two images side by side and asking them if they could perceive a difference between the two. 
Okay, so like here's the horse's ear, and boy, there's a blip on the, by the horse's ear in this image, and there's not a blip by the horse's ear in this image. These detection and discrimination experiments are much lower level. Okay, I could have shown them something, pictures, you know, images of things they didn't really understand. You know, aliens from Venus, some Elvis impersonator they've never seen before. You know, doesn't matter. Okay, they can, people people can do a side by side comparison when they don't understand the content. Okay, yet we see linear summation, or at least in our case, approximately linear summation. Now, think about this. We, we decided this probably makes sense, okay? Because we all know that horses sitting in the middle of a field with a blue sky behind them don't have ringing around their ears, right? When we walk around the world, we don't see ringing on edges. So we realized that probably people are not necessarily doing a side-by-side -side so much. They're using a prior information about what they know about the world to answer whether they can see problems in the images or not, and just using the original as a check. Okay, so was the image defective in the first place? Aha, no it's not, we'll go with that. Um, and, okay, so we, we, we come up with this conclusion, but then we see that these object recognition tasks also uh, were done in conjunction with a visual theory, experiments around a visual theory called global precedence. And this was a very fortunate thing for us to stumble upon because it's extremely relevant to image compression. Okay. So what is global precedence? Uh, the idea behind, so here's a beautiful, beautiful picture, a uh, high-def picture of an insect. The idea behind global precedence is that our visual system integrates content from low frequency to high frequency. Okay? So that's the way that we digest it and sort of add it up in our visual system in the brain. So if we take our bug, what is our visual system doing? First, it takes a very, very, very low frequency representation of that, right? In my case, it's very easy to get the low frequency representation. I think some of you are probably the same. And now, I'm going to do this in a discrete manner. Of course, we think the visual system is more continuous. So the visual system then integrates frequency content, or, you know, until it, in my case, it, it stops, right? It stops for all of us at some point. It either stops at the 2020 point, whenever we can't see the frequency anymore, or earlier, okay? But we integrate. Now, global precedence suggests that if we pull out intermediate scale frequency content, okay, if we pull it out, we cannot hop over it in the integration. Okay? We only integrate across frequencies that are present in a continuous manner. And as soon as content disappears, our integration stops. Okay? And this implies that if there is still frequency content sitting out there way beyond where the information was pulled out, we can't use it. Okay? Not only can we not use it, what does that mean? It means we actually perceive it as noise. Okay? Now, put on your signal processing hat. If I said, well, I have all of the frequency content here except these two bands. Should I include this when I reconstruct the image? Right? The answer is yes, of course you should. As the signal processor says this is valid information. It'll reduce my mean squared error. Right? And it sure will. But visually, you add this in, you're going to make the image look worse. Okay? And in fact, this is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. So here's an example of two images where we've actually added high frequency. This image has more high frequency content, has more content period than this one, looks worse. So what does this suggest? Don't code high frequency information when mid-level frequency content has been discarded. Okay. This is something that we as a community, I think, maybe had a sense of intuitively, but we never actually realized it. Okay. And again, we love mean squared error. So boy, you have valid stuff, you're going <coughs> to stick that in there. right? You're going to use it come hell or high water. Well, turns out shouldn't be doing that. So lastly, I think on the standard gain control model, all I'm going to do, I'm not going to give you the gory details, but remember I mentioned that there's a gain control model for masking. Okay, how much more of the sinusoid or of the wavelet basis function? Yes. I have a question. Yes. So this is very interesting what you said. Can you relate that to some of the circuit that you showed earlier, you know, the LGM to V1 to V2? Can you relate that to the these frequencies to those circuits as to those so, circuits? Okay. Okay. So, do I have a hypothesis of how this integration is going on in V1 or beyond? Yeah, in the in the whole. Okay. So, so about the only. 
I was going to say the only intelligent thing, but I'm not even sure it's intelligent. The only thing I can say definitively is I know that V1 actually does implement the, the, the multi-channel the multi frequency decomposition, okay, among many other things that it does. So it, 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 does, uh, it does a frequency decomposition and it pulls the image apart into the different frequencies. Now, what I can't answer, and I don't know at what point it's me not being familiar with the literature and at what point it's not known, is Okay, we know V1 does a lot of pulling apart. It also does edge detection. It does a lot of other stuff. What we don't know very well is how does all that get knit back together and where. So no, I can't tell you where it's done other than uh, if we look at that block diagram, it is known that some of the visual pathways deal with form and localization. Others deal with color and motion. So I know that has on a broad scale been put back together, but exactly where the, the, the frequency integration happens, I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, that's a great question. Are there other questions? Yes. So, uh, people who work with medical images notice that sometimes you add noise to the image, and the image looks sharper. Mm -hmm. And we Could that be explained by filling in those missing bands, and therefore you become perceptive to the higher bands which were there, but previously uh, you ignore. Okay. So the question is. Um, if you add noise to an image and the image looks better, we have also done experiments where we've observed this, uh, can that explain, can we use that to, can, can we put that in the context of global precedence? If you take other high frequency content out and you add high frequency content back in, can you explain how the things? It, well, I was exactly, right. I was exactly going to say that, that when we dither effectively or when we add in broadband noise, we're not adding in, yeah, this highly correlated noise with what's there. So, um, you know, I've not, I've not seen that explanation before, but it certainly sounds plausible. Yeah. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, so I'll just quickly mention the gain control model that we came up with, and, uh, and then I'll go on to the visual results, because I think that's the most interesting thing. So remember I mentioned that the standard gain control model works if you have a homogeneous texture patch. Of course, the challenge is if you slice an image up into arbitrary, say, you know, 24 by 24 blocks or however you want to process it, chances that you're going to have a homogeneous texture in any one of these blocks are, are slim to none. Um, now, based on uh, some of our observation-based results that what we, you know, we, we, we decided to go with linear summation, we looked for linear summation, we saw the linear summation had been used in object recognition tasks, we decided to try and develop a masking model that was not based on sort of the traditional split into textured regions, edge regions, and flat regions, which we ourselves have done in my lab and many other people have done in the past, but to go to a slightly higher level masking model where we take any arbitrary image patch and we, uh, we label it as being either a homogeneous texture, okay, so it doesn't, you know, has it looks similar to somebody, or it has an edge, okay, any kind of edge structure, but is not recognizable as standalone content, or it's what we call a structure patch. And the structure patch we define as being an individual patch that if you look at it, you immediately understand it to be something. Okay. Now, having said that, this edge patch here, can anybody recognize what that is? Uh, so this is, a, this is a measure of, of sort of an example of how our labeling works. So this, you know, so clearly we, we would say obviously it's an edge patch. It has very strong edges, but it has no recognizable structure. Now, as soon as I tell you that that came from a butterfly's wing, everybody immediately understands, right? Of course it did. Um, but if you just take it as is, right, you, you, you don't know what it is. You take the baby's eye. And you know, there's no question. You go to that and you recognize it as an eye, even though it's it's quite distorted. It's not a very high high resolution picture. And you know, this graph on the bottom is a good example of something you should never put in a talk because nobody can read it. But the 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 the, the point is that um, we can't fit the standard gain control model to structure patches and edge patches. We just can't. There's so many variables in the standard gain control model, but you cannot get the fit to work. So we did some experiments. Does it really make sense to do this tripartite split? Do we actually get consistent re results over multiple structure patches, 
multiple edge patches, and of course, multiple texture patches. I mean, we know we're going to do that. That's been repeated many times. So here's an example of the type of thing that we took for the edges. Um, we essentially did masking experiments for the three of them, and we came up with um, a way to just insert something into the gain control model, this GM term. Uh, we can make an, you know, use some nice words, an inhibitory modulation term. You know, the, the, the more important thing was when we put a constant out front here, we actually could get the fits to match. That was the only mathematically structural way we could get, get some fits going there. Okay. So we have nice fits now. Okay. So let's put everything together. Okay. So I'm going to show you two examples, okay, even though I have four listed here. Um, the first example I'm going to show you is an application of the masked CSF and summation and global precedence. Okay, so not that structural masking stuff. The second example I'm going to show you is what we get when we put the structural masking stuff in. Okay, and also the first example, okay, I'm going to talk about um, distortion contrast quantization. That's just to illustrate the strength of our models. Okay, I'm going to use a JPEG 2000 compression engine. So I'm not doing anything fancy on the signal processing side. Okay, I'm just going to use what we did to come up with quantization. This overhead free spatially uh, localized quantization, however, we will put in some signal processing and see then what kind of gains do we get when we have sort of uh, gains on the modeling side and gains on the signal processing side. Okay, so I'm going to show you some images here for DCQ. So again, we're using a JPEG 2000 engine here. Okay, so all the gains are coming from the quantization. We're using uh, the three items listed, and all this does, okay, is it picks 15 different quantization step sizes for JPEG 2000. Okay, that's the only thing that's going to be different, and it goes in and to apply the global precedent sometimes zeroes things out. Now, what we get is something that works seamlessly for all rates. Okay, now in JPEG 2000, if you're familiar with it, when you go to very low rates, you kind of have to flip a switch. You have to say, hello, JPEG 2000, please start behaving differently. Uh, when you, you know, whatever you're going to do, this is for the quantization strategy at very low rates. We don't have to do that with what comes out of our work. Okay, it, it works across all rates. So, uh, show you some images. So here's an original image. Um, there are Two things I'd really like you to observe about this image before I show you what comes out of uh, the compression. First is the water. Okay, it looks like water, right? Just <laughs> remember, it looks like water. Secondly, uh, it's a little bit hazy in the back of this image, but you see a full uh, skyline. Right? You can see everything back there. <coughs> okay, so now let's compress this at 0.4 bits per pixel, uh, all in JPEG 2000. Now, on the right-hand side, I say contrast-based JPEG 2000. Again, the only difference between these two images are 15 numbers for quantizing. Okay? So side-by-side -side comparison, first look at the water. Okay? There's no question there are distortions in both of these. Right? You can't code this image at 0.4 bits per pixel without seeing distortions. Okay? But I'm going to argue that the water in the DCQ-based quanti uh, quantized image still looks natural. It's a lot more like water. This looks like wavelet quantized water with blips in it. Okay. Secondly, take a look at the background. Okay. Take a look at the background. On the left hand side, you know, it looks like uh, Tehran on a bad day. You know, there's a tremendous amount of smog or something going on there. I mean, we really lost almost all the detail in that background content. The image on the right, again, it's not perfect, but you can still see the skyline. And lastly, uh, there's a lot less ringing on those diagonals. Okay. Now, there's nothing spatially localized here with the exception of dealing with global precedence. Okay. And I'll just point out that global precedence, you know, in this case, it would get rid of the blips in the water okay, if we implemented global precedence on this side, but we still would have lost the, the texture. Okay. So I'll just toggle back and forth a little bit. Here is what we get default. Here's what we get when you, we just change those, uh, those quantization step sizes. Okay, so a pretty big difference. Okay. So how kind of, what kind of gains do we get? Okay, so these are two very different images. This one has a tremendous amount of high frequency content. Okay, cat has fur, cat has whiskers, we've got the hat. The one on the right, sort of more like a normal image you might take with your digital camera. Okay. So if we go to the super high frequency content image, 
My x-axis, I'm comparing uh, or I'm lining things up on visual quality. So this is as judged by humans. Y-axis is the rate. So the proposed strategy um, is a little bit bigger, OK? A little bit at very high, uh, very high visual quality. But as we go down to very low visual quality, it's getting rate savings in the 10 to 20% range. Okay? Now, if you're used to working in compression, you know we get super excited about like 2.5%. So these are, these are quite big. Now this is for that very high frequency content image. When we go to the image that has a little bit more of a classical 1 over f structure, we're getting gains um, anywhere from 10 to 30%. 30% okay? smaller file for the same visual quality. So and again, nothing fancy on the compression. This is solely where we choose to put the errors. Okay, okay so last thing I'll just mention is overhead-free, spatially localized quantization. Now, ideally, what we'd like to do is take those texture, structure, and uh, edge masking results and quantize personally for each block in an image. Okay? But spatially localized quantization is not a new idea. right? As the community, we've been doing it for decades. But the challenge is you have this overhead right, of sending the map. And that overhead always kills the gains you get. So my student, Matt Galbatz, uh, made a very nice observation, which we all learn our first year in graduate school, conditioning reduces entropy. What if we condition, um, what if we use that okay, as side information, use the, the step size information as side information for compression? Okay. So I'll just skip his block diagram and go to the visual uh, results. Okay. Now, so again, now I'm, I'm doing a little bit of an unfair comparison because we're, we're running our own compression strategy here, again, with the visual uh, models added in. So two, this is just a sample, two regimes, barely visible distortion and very visible distortion. Okay. Two different images. First, we have people vote. So we have uh, at, by a, a uh, 75 to 25 percent uh, margin. People are preferring what's coming out of uh, the, the visually optimized thing at the same rate. And coincidentally, you know, you may say, "Gosh, why would she even put these results up six to two? Why didn't they find an image where it was eight to zero? Well, in fact, because of um, detection theory, really the, the right threshold you're looking for is 75 percent. Okay, the results on the, the the barely visible means we we actually probably didn't pick a fair comparison. Okay, um, we really want to aim. This is the operating point that we want to aim for to say yes, it was visually equal. Now, what I want to point out on this, the reason this table's here up the first place, is if you look at the peak signal to noise ratio. Remember, PSNR is a positive, happy way to look at mean squared error, right? Um, there are big differences in mean squared error between the images that people prefer and the images that, um, that have a, a, a lower mean squared error, sometimes up to nearly 5 dB. Okay? 5 dB more mean squared error, but people are preferring the one with the, with the more error. Okay? And that's across the board. You know, Down here, we have uh, over 4 dB. So it just goes to show that if you have a good visual system model and you do some nice signal processing that's sort of designed to go with it, boy, there are some tremendous gains to be had. And just to give you an example, here's our example image at threshold, our bug image. Of course, it looks like the original, especially with the projector. If we look at where that strategy puts the errors, okay, it's doing a very nice job of sticking them there. And of course, the gain here is that we don't pay any penalty for sending in uh, that side information for where, where to put the error. Okay, I'm going to skip multiple description coding. OK, so let me just wrap up by saying we have done a tremendous amount of psychophysical experimentation um, to come up with this. So this is, this is definitely a strategy or an area. If you want to work on something and not be scooped by somebody else working on the same problem, uh, do anything that involves humans. Boy, is it difficult. Um, so we've done these characterizations, and we've used them to drive signal processing algorithm development. Uh, we get things that outperform current state-of-the-art results. Um, not a surprise, because these models are more sophisticated. And we also apply this to design of a video quality measure okay, a long, 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 long time ago. 
what we're currently working on, as I said, is really almost all task-based. I'm very interested in if we throw away quality or whether people can detect a difference, but rather the question is, are these images equally useful to you? Can we characterize thresholds there? And of course, lastly, I need to thank all the students who really did all the work on everything. So I thank you all very, very much for coming in at 9 in the morning to listen to this and also for the questions. Are there more questions? Okay, of course I will be here all day. So if you have a question and you're shy, then um, you can ask me later. Or worse, I will chase you down and force you to ask a question. Yes? So suppose rather than looking at the, at the image uh, overall, zoom in. So we look at the image through a, a hole in a piece of paper and right. kind of slide it over. Do you get different results uh, when you evaluate it like that? Okay, so the question is if we specifically direct people to sub areas of an image, do we get different results? So I think there, there are kind of two questions there. Okay, one is would we get different results from the results we would get from the same image, okay, so all the individual pieces of an individual image compared with the results for the same image. The second question is, if we again do this averaging over all images and just trying to get content out, um, I suspect that at a very coarse level, there would not be a big difference. But perhaps at a finer level, so depending on how big the size of the picture is, like um, you know, if you look at that horse image, uh, people were clearly reacting to ringing that was very obvious to see around the ears if the snapshot that you're taking is so small that you're not going to get the ear as a structure itself, but you're only going to identify it as an edge. In other words, if that picture is so small that you're going to start moving responses, maybe relative on those masking plots, then yes, you're going to see different, uh, different results. Yeah, the motivation for the question is medical applications where radiologists would zoom in on some particular area and, and just look at that. Okay, so I can actually answer the, the I'm going to repeat what you said so that the recording gets it. Uh, the motivation being that uh, medical images will, medical, people looking at medical images will look at a specific region. Um, we did, okay, so we actually repeated some of these experiments with radiologists. We designed the experiments and we ran them in conjunction with a radiologist who, uh, and in fact, he teaches classes on reading digital radiographs to, to radi uh, radiologists. Um, what surprised me in the end was that Nick said that we should run the experiments exactly the same way that we did and that the radiologists themselves would tend to focus in on what was relevant and what wasn't. So I can't give you a lot of rationale or background, but him being the expert, we did what he said. So we measured a CSF and we measured summation values, um, CSF and mask CSF, for instead of natural images, uh, radiologists looking at um, radiographs. Okay? And we even controlled for, I think, the type of radiograph because it's, it's a, we work at the vet school because you don't need human subjects, you know. <laughs> approval. <laughs> so look at the horse's x-ray. And uh, I think he even, because of the size and, and variability of the animal size relative to the imaging, um, he even normalized for that type of thing. So I don't know if I can answer that as, a, as somebody who doesn't look at medical images. I'm so chicken to make comments about them because I really, every time I talk to Ned, I feel like I know nothing about this. And you know, I'm looking at an image thinking, my god, there's a huge problem there. And he looks at it and says, wow, something is wrong over here. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you all again. Thank you very much. Well, this is